Looks like we're live. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'm McKenna. I'm the owner of Murder by the Book here in Houston, Texas. And I am very excited to be joined by Mark Pryor, the author of the Hugo Marston books. He is here today to talk with us about his new book, The French Widow. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, McKenna. How are you? I'm well, thank you. I'm going to give your I'm going to give your uh, official bio real quick, and then we'll get to chatting. Um, Mark Pryor is the author of the Hugo Marston mystery novels, some of six of which are set in Paris, France, but also feature London and Barcelona. The books have been translated into eight languages, and the film and television rights were recently optioned to like entertainment with a view to putting Hugo on the screen, which is very exciting and we're going to talk about later. Mark also authored two psychological thrillers set in Austin, Texas, where he lives. So as I said, he's here today to talk about number nine, The French Widow. He's also sent a signed book plate, which we have for anyone who'd like to um, purchase the book through Murder by the Book. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to um, open up Facebook on my phone and put a link to where you can purchase or get more information about the books. Um, but for now, how are you, Mark? Good. Yes, we're, we're actually on kind of a vacation right now um, in South Dakota, about an hour from Mount Rushmore. Uh, so I'm set up in the basement. And if uh, if kids run past, my apologies, but um, we're making do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, it's so nice, actually, um, now that everyone's learned how to do these Zoom virtual events, we're talking with people all over the place. So you could go on vacation and we could still be talking to you first week of on sale. <laughs> now we just have to trust the Wi-Fi is good, right? It's working so far, knock on wood. <laughs> um, so I've learned that we have a lot of people who tune in and watch these events um, to discover new authors. Can you tell us a little bit about your main character, Hugo? Yes, indeed, yeah. Uh, his name is Hugo Marston. Um, he is uh, he used to be in the FBI, as a, worked as a profiler, uh, but now he's head of security at the US Embassy in Paris. Um, and as a, as a result of that job, he gets to uh, stick his nose into police business when it involves American citizens. Um, so it's a nice, easy way for him to get uh, lots, of, lots of action. Excellent. And what does he find himself, uh, what kind of trouble does he find himself in on this book? Well, in this book, he um, is trying to investigate an attack on uh, Tammy Fotinos, who is a, an American. Uh, she works at a museum that it's actually a museum most of the year, but one week a year, the family who own it uh, descend on the house for the Bastille Day, uh, July 14th. And they have a big party. And uh, the night before the party, she's attacked. And because she's American, Hugo gets to go uh, investigate. But unfortunately, the family that own it is um, full of secrets and not very welcoming and not loving of Americans. Uh, and so he has to battle uh, with them and on at least one occasion gets, gets thrown out of the house. <laughs> um, there's also another plot going on in this book where um, Hugo does something that many would be, view as heroic, but also may be criticized um, for that. Um, kind of, you want to talk a little bit about that incident and why uh, you chose to kind of put Hugo through that? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm sure everybody watching knows that Americans have a different view of, of guns, and this, this incident involves a gun. Um, and uh, it's, very, it's a very interesting difference between the American view of, of guns and the European view. Although since 9-11, uh, Europeans are a lot more armed than they used to, especially the police and the military. But I always found it quite an interesting uh, dichotomy. And, and so when I have friends come over here, um, from Europe, usually from England, I'll, you know, I'll take them to a range and they'll touch a gun for the first time ever. Um, but uh, you were asking about Hugo. Interestingly, when I, all these many years ago, I wrote the first book, I did it not really knowing anything about the job that he had. Um, but once the bookseller came out, I went to, I emailed the, the State Department, uh, hoping to find out some information about, you know, what these guys really do. And uh, they invited me to come to the, the embassy in Paris. Uh, to talk to the Hugo. Unfortunately, when I was there, he was not. So I had to talk to his second command, which is, you know, was fine. But I sat down with this guy for about four hours and we just talked about the job and everything. And the one question, and he, he sort of asked me what, what I had Hugo doing generally. And I told him and he said, yeah, that's about right. 
Um, but I said to him, one thing I really want to know is, you know, can you carry your gun when you're around about in Paris? Um, and he said, well, you know, that's, that always depends on the embassy negotiating with the local government and they'll reach an agreement as to whether that's okay or not. And I said, well, okay, but when you're around in Paris, can you carry your gun? Um, Cause this is the one thing I want to know if I had right. Yeah. And he said, um, well, it's, it's always going to depend because you have different, you have changing local authorities, you have changing, you know, ambassadors and state department. And I'm like, dude, do you, can you carry your gun? And he says, what do you have Hugo doing? And I said, I, I have him with his gun in, as he's going around, you know, walking to and from work, for example. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I wouldn't say you've got that wrong. So <laughs> I was quite pleased. I did get the make of gun wrong, but as he said, no one's going to know, and anyone who knows isn't really going to care. Well, there you go. Um, so you are actually yourself, you are an uh, assistant district attorney in Travis County. Um, what made you start writing? Did you always want to be a writer? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, I think back now to um, even when I was a little kid, uh, we had uh, this one incident that I always remember. I must have been eight, nine years old or something. Uh, I had a, a, in the local village primary school, which was elementary school, um, we had, I had a teacher, Mrs. Garwood, I think was her name. And for, for the English class, she gave us two, two books. One was a, a book that anything had, like it's called a news book. So if you did something exciting, you put it in the news book. And then she had a book for, for making up stories. Well, I remember coming back from the summer holidays one year and uh, I grew up on a farm, I lived on a farm. So um, she, she had us pull out you know, our news books and write down uh, what we did, something that happened in the summer. And I wrote a uh, true story, started off true about myself and my best friend playing on a haystack, having a great time building a castle. And then suddenly we were attacked by alligators. <laughs> I had to save his life by beating off the alligators with a stick. And, uh, and I, think I, know, I think I knew I was going of course a little bit as far as news. But I never remember, I never forget that she gave me like a gold star for that. She never said, <laughs> that's not true. Like I, I sort of see that as my first real encouragement um, to write stories. And, um, and, I, and I put it aside for a long time, but got back to it uh, 15 years ago, I suppose. Um, and actually wrote three novels before the, the bookseller got published. So I've been at it a while. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I, I won't make, make people wait longer. Why don't you tell us about your TV, your, your movie news? That's fantastic. It is. It is. I'm, I'm uh, hopeful. These things, I, as you know, McKenna, one of the, the biggest uh, jobs we have in this business is to wait, um, whatever it's for. Uh, I was very excited to get, to get that offer. Um, I think it's been kind of put off a little bit because of the virus. But they just uh, the, the uh, option period was about to expire, but they've extended it. So good. if that's a good sign or not, um, but I would sure love to see Hugo on the TV. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has it has everything that you want for a good TV series. Like it's got you know a great character and a great setting and great plot. I mean, it, it's it's made for it. So hopefully, hopefully it'll all work out. I know a lot of people are on hold because of COVID, obviously with TV and movie deals. So if, if yeah. they extended the option, that's probably, that's promising. I hope um, so. Yeah, so um, speaking of these weird times in which we live, are you, um, you're writing? Are you able to get some writing done? Ah, uh, gosh, when I sort of hold a gun to my own head a little bit, um, I, I think talking to other writers, everyone's finding it really, really difficult. Um, I'm working on, on a potential new series uh, that my agent has the first one. I'm working on the second. So uh, every now and again, I'll force myself. Um, but it's really, really hard. I've, I've done a lot more reading. For some reason, I'm able to do that. Um, but the, the writing is, once I sit down and make myself, I can get, I can squeeze some words out. But the, the kind of the emotional energy, energy to do it yeah. is, is tough. Yeah, you know, I... I... In talking to so many people during this time, so many authors about how they're coping with it, there's one of two, there's two camps, either they're like you 
and they're they're struggling and the emotional energy is hard to find. I mean, I I struggle with reading. I struggle with doing anything that's not either being a workaholic or frankly putting it together Legos. Like I am <laughs> I'm either working all the time or I'm in some kind of occupying mental escape, but really struggling with reading, um, which is, you know, which is tough. It's hard for the job. But anyway, the writers either are in um, a camp where they've turned their book in three months early and they're just using this extra time to just write and write and write, or they're like you, where they're kind of just not quite, it's not yeah. flowing. So I'm, I'm very, I'm very envious of them. And the other thing is I don't, I don't have a, uh, a deadline looming, which may also be a and that's probably for the first time in eight years. Um, yeah. So they have something to do with it as well. Um, but mostly I think it's, it's, the, it's the virus's fault. Yeah, exactly. I think, we, I think we can have that as an excuse for a long time coming. <laughs> I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you uh, were an aspiring writer as a, as a child. Um, did you grow, what kind of books did you grow up reading? What were kind of those formative books that made you want to write? Um, I remember mostly, it was mostly mysteries. I mean, surprise, surprise, right? Uh, Hardy Boys, um, The Three Investigators. I don't know if you had that over here. Oh, you did? Okay. Were they American or? I think, they're, I think they were American. I think that they were, they involved Alfred Hitchcock. Either he sponsored them, right? Is, am I, is that the right series where he had they, cameos with the three they, kids? Yeah, and they, like one of them like lived under a big pile of trash in a... <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, I think so. The, it, oh, wow. Three Investigators is definitely a, an American series. I will yeah. be, I'm sure someone here is going to correct me if, if I'm wrong in the comments, but um, I, I think it's an American series. I will say I've spoken with two people this past week who said they read Enid Blyton growing up, which is not an American <laughs> mystery series. And I am not familiar with her at all, but I now want to go back and read them because I grew up on Nancy Drew. We didn't really... Right. Have Enid Blyton as a thing here, so yeah, I told you would um, be a strange child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, but I had uh, Agatha Christie was like I read everything that she had written, um, and Sherlock Holmes probably my favorite stories, um, and our Hugo's favorite stories too. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, today's Christie's birthday, so it was a nice shout out to the the Dame of Mystery. Yes, um, indeed. <laughs> So uh, let's get back to your, to your uh, Hugo books. They are set almost all uh, in Paris. So why Paris and what is your personal experience with the city? Um, well, let me put it a different way. Uh, as you know, Jim Ziskin and Terry Shames, two fine authors. Uh, one sets his books in rural New York and the other in East Texas. And I'm like, yeah. guys, what's research like for you? Yes. That's, that's the primary reason. I mean, I've been to Paris now probably 20 something times. Um, and, but the honest truth is that, that I had the idea for the book, for the bookseller, the first one, while I was in Paris, um, just walking along by the River Seine, seeing a, a, one of these booksellers by the, by the river. Um, and as I always tell people, you know, if, if you're friends with a mystery writer or you're talking to one, there's a good chance they're plotting your death right now. Um, so I just saw this old boy and I was like, wow, I wonder if anybody would kill him. And if they did, why would they do it? <laughs> um, and that was really the, the, the start of the series. I mean, I just. Mark, I think that if you can hear me, you're, you're frozen. Hi, everyone, we're back. Um, thanks for your patience. I'm going to uh, go ahead and put a note in the previous event just so everyone sees that we are, are back on here again. Um, but let's go ahead and continue like nothing ever happened and I'll, I'll edit this together in a little bit. Um, yeah, sorry, so the giant elk came through and knocked out the router <laughs> and the bear came in behind it and I had to like throw them both out. So it just took a while. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you barely broke a sweat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we were talking, I think we were talking about research in Paris um, yes. that you chose that that was the place to, to be. And then you envisioned people that you could kill walking along the Seine. Um, so have you been, uh, do you go back for each book? Yes, yes. In fact, we, um, 
in in February was my last trip um, and was quite quick and got in just before the virus shut everything down. Um, and so I uh, managed to do some some research then uh, and then pop over to England to see see my family. But yeah, yeah time. I mean, the, the thing about research for me is um, I know you can use Google Maps and these days we'll have to do that a bit more. But I always feel like um, when you're there, you're in person, you'll see things that you won't see uh, on Google Maps. And the, the example I give is, is a, a, a cobbled street I came across in the middle of nowhere in Paris uh, while walking to the train station to meet my mum. And um, the, the, it, would, it was a fairly bland area, but there was this sort of narrow sloping cobbled street. And there was like a cheese shop here and then a wine shop to my left. And then a, a guy stood on the stoop of his little cafe smoking a cigarette before he opened up. And, and then up ahead of me, this girl comes zooming around the corner. She's, she's on a bicycle. Um, her, her scarf and her hair is flowing behind her and she's pulling a, a wheeled suitcase behind her. Um, and it was just, it was so, I don't know, atmospheric, evocative, whatever. Um, but I, I wouldn't have seen that if I just checked out that street on Google Maps. Um, yeah. I have my little notebook, so I write that down immediately and otherwise I'll forget. Well, I'm sure that's what helps make the book so atmospheric is that um, you actually witness little things like that and you can put them, put them in the books. Um, so do you have a favorite spot that you go to uh, in Paris every trip? I try to go somewhere different every trip um, because just because I'm inquisitive and I want to get to know the city better. Um, but I discovered on one of my trips that when you think you know a place, you don't. I mean, the previous book, The Book Artist, is set in Montmartre, uh, which is a little bit north of, of the main part of Paris. And I've been there a few times, but it's, and it's really old. It used to be just a village before it kind of got sucked into Paris proper. Uh, but it's full of cobbled winding streets, um, leads up to the Sacre Coeur, uh, and I didn't like it. I didn't like that area because it was so touristy. Um, all the cafes were packed and just, it was just jam packed with tourists. Um, but for that book, I went maybe two weeks before Christmas um, and it was cold and it was damp and uh, there was no, literally no tourists. I mean, I didn't see anybody. I walked from my hotel to the Sacre Coeur and didn't see a single soul. And it's amazing. Oh, it was, the, the streets were glistening, cobbles were glistening, and they were reflecting the Christmas lights of the restaurants that, that were still there and still open. And, you know, you could easily get a table. And it was so different from anything I'd ever seen uh, from that area. So, again, I was, you know, really able to try and incorporate that into the book to give it some atmosphere. Yeah. Um, all right. So we had a question. I, I think I've lost the questions that were in the comments from the first uh portion of this, but I remember a couple. So I'm going to do them before I completely forget. Um, is your new series that you're working on something you can talk about? And is it set in Paris? Yeah, I guess I can talk about it. Why not? Um, the, the, where we're at right now, my agent has the first book, which she tells me she loves. Um, I've had a few people read it and they, they really like it. Um, it's set in uh, 1940 in Paris. Right. And um, as, a, as a, a gimmick or a fun little thing, I have my own character um, living in the same apartment that Hugo lives in. Oh, that's great. So, yes. So anybody who reads uh, uh, The French Widow might see a clue about that towards the end of the book. Um, that's nice. It's, it's, yeah, it's going to be a, a hopefully a series. Uh, my main character, is uh, uh, his name is Henri, named after my son. Um, and I let him choose the last name, so he went with Lefort, so it's Henry the Strong, <laughs> of course. Um, but you know what, I discovered something very interesting about writing historical fiction, because I've never done it, um, and that is the difficulty of putting in anything but white male characters. Because anybody who had a position of power or responsibility back then um, looked disconcertingly like me. Uh, but, I, but I have managed to get around that because uh, there is a, one of the, the major characters is um, Lady Bonaparte, who is the grand niece of Napoleon. 
who was going to be a side character. Um, and, and I ended up reading a biography of her and she's fascinating. She was friends with uh, Sigmund Freud um, and she was big into psychotherapy. And so she becomes kind of a, uh, a friend or mentor or even a therapist to, to Henri who has a few issues because he was in the, in the First World War. So he has some PTSD type stuff um, and she's working with him on those, but she, I love that she's become a significant character in the, in the book and then hopefully the series. That sounds wonderful. That sounds great. I can't wait to read it. Um, so this book deals a lot with art. What did you do for your research? Do you have some insider you talked to or visited a lot of museums? A lot of Googling. <laughs> I, did do, I did visit some museums. Um, um, yeah, I, I want to say something about the art, but it kind of gives something away, so I probably shouldn't. Um, no, the, 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 how, the, the, the setting for the book um, is uh, a house that uh, I visited on one of the trips there. It's, it's a tourist attraction, it's a museum, um, but it's really not well known at all. I mean, when I was there, I think there was maybe one other family or something there, uh, but, it was, but it was perfectly preserved. It was built, I think it's called the Musée Nissim de Commando. If anybody wants to Google that, if they can spell it. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a lovely old house. All the furniture was, was preserved. Uh, the, the family had a real tragic story, um, which I don't want to tell now because I'll get it wrong. Um, but it's, it's been preserved as, as, and there was just beautiful furniture and most of which you couldn't sit on, uh, but artwork. And it just, in writing this book, I wanted to create that, recreate that house and maybe send them a few more tourists, who knows. Great. Um, so those of us who've been reading Hugo for a while find him a great character. Um, in what ways do you see yourself in Hugo and in what ways do you differ? Um, Hugo is more of a goody goody than I am. Um, and that's why I created his sidekick, Tom, just to, to take him down a notch or two. I think, I think Hugo is, I see him in other people more than myself, like my father, uh, very unjudgmental, very thoughtful, um, analytical. Um, you know, I concede he's like my father, probably not the funnest guy in the world. Um, but, you know, I guess you asked me earlier about the, the books I, I read growing up and I sort of see Hugo as a bit of a throwback to some of the old fashioned uh, heroes um, and just sort of a, just a good, like a truly good guy through and through. Yeah. Um, again, that's why he needs Tom to um, sponge off him and bring hookers into his apartment and all the fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To balance him out. Yeah. Um, so let's get a little bit into the process. Um, do, do, in your writing, does Hugo ever take the wheel? Does he ever say, no, Mark, I don't think that that's true to my character. You need to write something else. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, think, I think the answer has to be yes. The one thing I've discovered about writing a series is that I know some of these characters I know them so well now that I, I don't have to consciously think, what would Tom do? What would Hugo do? Uh, what would they say? I know, I know what they would say. And that, that comes out a lot when I'm having the banter between Hugo and Tom. I know exactly, I can, it's like I'm sitting there and they're, they're sipping wine and making fun of each other. I can, I can hear it. Um, and so, and, and particularly, I think in this book too, um, in every book, I try, to, I try to tweak him a little bit, make him uncomfortable. Um, I can't remember in one of them, I had him find a, a, a recording of his, his deceased wife's voice on a voice recorder and just to kind of get him to provoke him a bit. Um, and I did it a bit more spectacularly in this book with, with that incident involving the gun um, because I knew that, you know, he becomes uh, sort of a central figure in a, in a news story and I knew he would hate that. Um, but like it was, I knew Tom would hate it too and try and steal the thunder and steal the, steal the light, which he does, of course. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 while he does direct almost everything he does, every now and again, I kind of stick my foot in to trip him up, just to try and, almost so I can get to know him a little bit better myself. 
Um, what would what would Hugo do if I throw this at him? If you if you did what? Like like what would Hugo do if I threw this at him? Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, just because he's very taciturn and um, you know thoughtful, it's yeah, it's exactly what. How's it? You're right. Who you got, how are you going to deal with this? Deal with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you keep your um, characters and the tiny details? Do you keep all that in a journal or post it? Or is it just all in your head? I know I should. I know I should. And, then, you know, before I while I was writing before, I don't know which one it was. I, I heard this thing called a series Bible where you have to write down you know, everything, major things about the characters, where they went to school, height, weight, all that stuff. But of course, the thing about writing your first book is, you know, I mean, especially I got three books that never got published. And then I wrote the bestseller. I never, never really thought it would see the light of day. I had no great expectation that it would. And so, of course, I didn't bother to create any kind of series Bible. Um, and then three or four books in when I'm like, oh, maybe I should have. It's too late because that would require... Unless you're going back. go back and <laughs> like you're not busy enough. No, no, I am definitely not volunteering to do that. However, um, that is the good thing about readers. They will always tell you if you got something wrong. <laughs> yes, yes. I have several stories about that. Um, uh, but they, they're always very nice. It always starts off, you know, um, dear Mark, uh, loved the bookseller. Um, uh, just thought I'd let you know. Uh, and the classic one I always tell people is, is I got an email from relating to the bookseller from a, a reader who said, um, so the book's set in winter and partly in Paris and partly in the south of France in the Pyrenees Mountains where my, my mother happens to live. And so the, this lovely kind reader pointed out that uh, I had geraniums in the, in the window boxes in front of the hotels. And she said they, it's winter, they wouldn't have them then. And she said, also, you know, um, you have Hugo eating a, a dessert in the Pyrenees that has strawberries and you, you can't get strawberries in the Pyrenees in winter. And so I was like, OK, so I phoned my mum, And I'm like, mom, can you can you get strawberries in the Pyrenees in winter? And there was a hesitation and she goes, yeah, but I think it'd be cheaper if you just buy them there. And I, <laughs> no, no, no. I just need to know if you can buy them in, in, in in the store and she goes yeah it's not 1800 they're a bit more expensive but i can get them um and so i very politely wrote back to this lady and said oh my my mum who lives there reassures me that you can and i didn't say anything about what i suspect to be plastic uh geraniums in the in the hotel window boxes because you don't want to be a smart aleck <laughs> uh, you oh, know I've, I've already had an email from a reader on the french widow um who is unhappy about something but what can you do? Listen, you know, it, if I've learned anything since March, it's that we keep trying to do the best we can with excellent content, free content, talking to authors, supporting authors, getting books to customers as quickly as we can. And we're working so hard and there's always one. So, you know, all you can do is just keep doing what the best you can do. And, and if, if 99.99 um, say that it's great and one doesn't, then true on. <laughs> You're always going to end up uh, interviewing that idiot author with the crappy Wi-Fi who like, <laughs> I know it's terrible. Yeah, it's exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's so, it's so easy to do interviews when it's just me. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so when you are writing, when it's not um, the middle of a pandemic, um, what does your typical day look like? Because you you work as well. You're not a full time writer. Right. Yeah, I have my day job. Um, so usually, what I'll do is uh, spend three or four hours on a Saturday, on a Saturday afternoon, um, go to a coffee shop, library, something like that, and just just write. Uh, and I, you know, I'm kind of lucky that I, having been a, a journalist. And now a lawyer, I, I write fairly quickly. Um, other, I hear other writers talking about their first drafts being terrible and they, they just have to get it down and then they can rework the whole thing. But um, for me, my first draft is, is fairly close to the final uh, edition. Um, but just because I, and you know, I'm spending other time, driving time, whatever's thinking about what's coming next. So by the time right. 
Um, somebody has asked me to write a blog post about writer's block once, and I was like, I, I don't have time for writer's block. Um, so that was that was my next question to those people who always ask, what do you do if you have writer's block? Uh, sounds like you just well, write. I, you know what though? I guess I, maybe I have it now. Um, I didn't, I didn't because I didn't have the time for it because I knew I had to get stuff down on paper. But uh, maybe what we're all suffering from now is some form of writer's block. But I'm not sure I really believe in it because I know that if I if I had a deadline or if, if I had a genius idea or something, I could make myself do it. Um, but usually, Sorry. you know, in the normal course of things, I don't have. I don't have a lot of free time because you know the job, free kids, um, and then I just and I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm extremely lucky um, because um, just because I just have all my hours filled. <laughs> right, and I'm sure part of that comes from having the journalism background too, where you you're used to writing on a deadline. You need to write a something, you write it, that's it, um, yeah, as opposed you know, to just writing as a hobby. Yeah, exactly. And I tend not to write um, very sort of flowery or excessive um, prose or very good prose for that matter. <laughs> but I just, I know, I know what it is I'm trying to say and I kind of stick to that pretty much. Um, really the only, the only time I give myself leeway is when it comes to, to giving Paris a bit of atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you find it a challenge to, when you sit down to write your fiction, do you find it a challenge to switch from the technical writing that you do in your day job or are you just kind of switch and that's that? I'm, I'm lucky in that uh, the kind of lawyering that I do um, as a prosecutor, I do much less writing than I used to mm -hmm. when I was in civil practice. So uh, mostly what I do now is um, is not not writing, not motions right. sort of stuff for which I'm quite pleased um, because yeah, that would be pretty jarring, I think. And because I don't have writing to do, it makes it Kind of opens up a vacuum for me to do to do the fiction. Right, right. Um, we do have a couple questions from the comments. So, um, and Judy has been kind enough to to type this question on the previous Facebook Live and this one. So I I can't neglect it. Um, what are you currently reading? I am currently reading a book called The Splendid and the Vile. Um, it's Eric Larson's latest book. Um, I've had it on my shelf ever since it came out and I've looked forward to it. And I started it two days ago and I'm probably halfway through it, I think. It's a big book um, and it's fantastic. Um, as I don't know, it, yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with his, his books, but um, it, was it Judy who asked the question? Yes. Yeah, Judy, if, if you haven't tried Eric Larson, everything he writes is brilliant and everything he writes, in my mind, keeps getting better and better. And, and this book is, um, it's about uh, Churchill and uh, World War II, basically. So I guess it's fitting that I'm reading that, considering what I'm working on. But he's he's a, a fantastic writer. Um, and if you haven't tried him and you're not necessarily a hardback reader, we always recommend it, particularly if you're um, a Texas, um, if you reside in Texas, we always recommend the book he did on the Galveston storm, Isaac's storm, because it's you know local history that a lot of people don't necessarily know as much about. He's also most famous for Devil in the White City. Um, yeah, and Isaac Storm is his wife's favorite book of his. Oh, is it? I didn't know that. And we talk about that book all the time. So you learn something every day. Um, so uh, who else are some of your favorite um, authors? Like, who do you not miss a book by? Um, gosh, who do I just read? Um, well, it used to be Philip Kerr. Um, read everything that he wrote. Um, I'm a big fan of, and I hate to say this in case he hears it, James Ziskin. He's definitely watching. So uh, he's going to have the sound bite of that, a little video made. It's going to be his own yeah. gif of you saying that. <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm a big fan of his books. Um, Terry Shames also. Um, unfortunately, I don't, well, until this happened, I, I, that was the one thing that I didn't have enough time for. Uh, was um, was reading. I had to cut something out, and <laughs> I cut out exercise and reading. Apparently, um, but who else? Jenny Hillier. Her new book is fantastic. It is really, really good. And I read something else that just I just yeah I should know. If it comes to me, I'll mention it. 
Okay, but perfect. I, yeah, the Ginny Hillier is great. Yeah. Uh, so um, Alan asks, hi, Mark, big fan. What kinds of things do you do to spark additional inspiration as you write? Hi, Alan. Um, thank you for the question. I don't know if this is true of everybody, but um, as I mentioned before, like whenever I'm in a new situation or pretty any, any, any situation, I'm always wondering whether I can use it in a book. Um, and like, as far as ideas, um, I, I, I have too many. <laughs> I, need, I need another couple of me's to write them down. I mean, it can be something really small. I, I remember um, getting into the shower after one of my kids and the shower head obviously was turned more directly down and I had to alter that. And, and I ended up using that as a clue in a book because you know somebody was supposed to have been the last person to use the shower, but Hugo noticed that the shower head was turned inappropriately. Um, so it's, it's, the brain is always ticking over, Alan. It's always going. Um, and I have, I do have, um, so I have a notebook for every book I'm working on. And then I have another one that's uh, for the, what I think is going to be the next book. And then I also have notes for sort of general ideas. Um, I just, I need to quit my job and write full time. <laughs> I hope my boss isn't watching this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh gosh, I had a question and it just left me. Oh goodness. Um, that's terrible, terrible job interviewing, forgetting my question. Um, oh, I remember it. You know, I just finished a book of hers, my first book of hers, The Long Who's? Drive. Denise, Denise Minor. Oh yeah, yeah, she's great. Yeah, I've, the, somebody recommended um, her to me and I think I ordered it from you guys too, actually. Um, oh and, and it was great, it was very different, but it was excellent. I mean, not different in a bad way. I thought it was a fantastic book, The Long Drive. Yeah. She's, yeah, she's fabulous. Um, she's a great Scottish author, been doing a, a good job um, with kind of dark-ish books for some time. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I think she should be better known. She's perfect if you like Tana French, for example. Um, I do like Tana French. That reminds me, um, Jamie Mason is another great author that I, I'm a big fan of. She and Tana French, to me, I sort of put them in a similar bracket. Right, right, for, for sure. Um, so I remember my question. Do you yeah. have a favorite motive? Um, you know, it's funny you asked that question because at one point I wrote, I listed all my books and then I wrote down the motives for each book because I, want to, I wanted to vary it. And it turns out I do have a favorite motive and I, I'm sure it says nothing about me, um, but it's financial gain. Um, and so I made a, it's a great question actually. And I did, I promise you, everybody's watching. I did not feed this to McKenna um, because I made a point in this book, The French Widow of not making it financial gain. Um, and obviously I can't say what it is, but it's, it's something that is different. <laughs> so I, I have done a lot of these and I normally ask that question in the form of a P.D. James quote. And it keeps failing me so many times that I decided not to use it tonight. So the quote that I normally say is, P.D. Jo James said that um, there are only four motives for murder, love, lust, loathing and lucre and people always tell me it's none of those four it's fear or uh secrecy being discovered but you actually said lucre so <laughs> yes, we'll I, it's the first time i haven't prefaced it with the pd james quote but i'm glad that i'm glad to know that she is right in your book with one of them <laughs> i think you could argue with the french widow that that's into those four as well yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does, it does, um, it fits most of them. Um, but the one that keeps coming up in conversation is fear, fear of being discovered or your life, you know, being altered in some way. And I guess that doesn't really fit her four L's, but right. anyway, um, uh, m moving on from that, we do have, um, a question about your Dominic books, um, share, uh, excuse me, Butch would like to know, are there any more Dominic books in the works? And why don't you actually tell us about your two standalones um, really quickly while we're on that topic? Okay. Hi, Butch. Hi, Sharon. I'm sure you're both watching. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I wrote two books uh, set here in Austin 
featuring a uh, main character who's, um, okay, let me emphasize fiction, okay? So the main character is English, um, he's the prosecutor with the DA's office in Austin, um, and he is a psychopath. Um, so nothing like me. Uh, he's also a musician, and I, I'm not. Um, but I wanted to try something very different to Hugo, and Dominic is very different to Hugo. Uh, the books are dark, and uh, um, I had one friend who's a psychiatrist, sorry, a psycho psychologist, tell me she wasn't going to read the second one because the first one creeped her out too much, which I took to be a huge compliment. Right. Um, but they're very, they're very, uh, I think the first one was compared to the usual suspects, just in the way that I kind of set the plot up. Um, it's a lot tighter than, than the Hugo books, I think. Um, and I think they're, I think they're two, two of the best books that I've written. Um, unfortunately, it seems like the buying public hasn't necessarily agreed with that. Um, so again, it's sort of when I, when I look at my time and what I'm going to write, I would love to write another Dominic book which I would, uh, but you know, if, if you and Sharon are the only ones who buy it, then it may not be worth, unless I remember I just write it for you guys. Um, but it's until I have more time. Um, and also he's such a bad dude that I have to tie it up and have something appropriate happen. But I, and I haven't really decided what that is. Uh, <laughs> so it's definitely not off the table. Um, quite the opposite. One day it will probably happen, but um, I'm just, it has to be, that would have to be more a labor of love than, um, and, and really knowing what I'm going to do with him or to him. Yeah. Well, and you've got the new series coming now, so maybe at some point you can, you can return to him. Um, we do have other fans for the Dominic books in the comments. So it's not just Butch, just so you know. Okay. Love it. Love it. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of prioritizing your time and, and spending it on what you either com commercially should be writing or new things. Um, and we have a question, if I can find it, uh, from Sherry. How do you handle working another job and writing on the side? You know, my, my job is very exacting and um, occasionally stressful and obviously deals with very serious issues and, and uh, because all the cases I, I handle are felony cases um, and so I have that during the day and then you know somebody put this idea in my head ages ago that, that writing maybe is my way because the truth is that the, the really bad guys don't always get their comeuppance and a lot of a lot of victims don't get um, the help they need the restitution or the satisfaction of whatever it is um, and I don't have any control of that as a prosecutor. There's not, there's nothing I can, often there's not, there's a certain amount I can do, but it's not always what I would like. But in the books, I can do whatever I want. Uh, I can have the bad guy fall into a vat of glue and get stuck to a giant blue well and send him out to the middle of the ocean if I want. Um, I can have people fall in love. I can, I can do, do all kinds of things. So um, it's, I don't, I don't think I'm a particularly controlling person um, but I do know that I do have that measure of control in the books. Um, and I can make sure that, that the good guy always wins and the bad guy always loses. Um, in, in terms of sort of procedure and, and function, um, as I said, you know, my, my job is, is, is busy and exacting, but, but I work for some very, very good people who don't expect me to work on weekends, who don't expect me to work unless I'm in trial or something. I don't work late at night. Um, so I have my evenings, I have my weekends. Uh, so, you know, and, and I have sort of an advantage with that job too, because if, if I create a crime scene in my book, I don't have to find a detective to explain to me how a crime scene works because right. I know. Um, and so I have sort of a, a leg up as far as writing those scenes too. It sounds like it's almost um, therapeutic because you can, you can set things right in the books. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really can, and and I can set things right, um, and then you know have a have a glass of wine in a Paris cafe with Hugo and Claudia or something. You know, it's. I mean, who doesn't want to do that? I know. I mean, especially <laughs> now, right? Exactly. That's that's the the truth. Yeah. Um, 
So we're getting to the point in the evening where I always, um, when I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one interview with an author, I like to do questions from the Proust questionnaire, not the very difficult to make you think for hours questions, but just some fun little questions. Okay. Um, if people have watched me do one of these before, then this is repetitive. But um, for those of you who don't know, Marcel Proust came up with this set of questions in the late 1880s. Um, to get to know people at cocktail parties, dinners, et cetera. So they kind of um, are glimpsed into the person. Um, so my first question to you is, what is your most prized possession? And inanimate, not your children or dog or, yeah. Um, I think my most prized possession is a set of um, Purdy shotguns that were made for my great grandfather in 1898. Um, what happened? Um, to my grandfather and then to my father and then they're now in my possession. They're a beautiful pair of guns that I used when I was younger, but I wouldn't use them now. That's great. I love that question because you never know, like it's, it's, it's personal, but there's always something like something cool you hear about. So that's great. Um, what is the trait that you most value in a person? Um, I like people who are funny. I mean, honesty is probably the obvious answer, but um, I like funny, engaging people. Like the people, if I was to have a dinner party, I've done this in my mind, who would I invite? It's, you know, Ricky Gervais and um, Trevor Noah and John Sisley. It's those kinds of people, intelligent, funny people. Right, right. Well, it would never be a, a boring time. <laughs> um, okay, and my last question for you tonight is, what is your idea of ultimate happiness? Oh, that's a weird time to be asking that question. <laughs> I know, I know. A, a one-off vaccine. Um, I, I think just the time to read, the time to write, the time to be with friends and family. I mean, it's it's not that complicated. Um, maybe a maybe a nice apartment in Paris. Yeah. And then do all those things there. Right. Exactly. The time in yeah. that nice apartment. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds wonderful. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us this evening, Mark. Um, and thank you to those out there watching. I apologize for our little cut off in the middle, but I know most of you have found your way back to the second half here. Um, if it's a little, it's been a little fragmented and you missed things, um, I will get an edited video up on YouTube um, probably by Thursday. Tomorrow is my day off and I'm going to take it. So um, I will get it up on Thursday and we'll have it posted on social media um, for those of you who want to watch the whole thing. And um, we do have copies of um, The French Widow in stock and we have signed book plates. Um, currently the store is still doing curbside pickup mostly. We're there uh, Monday through Saturday. 10 to 6 for curbside pickup. We're also processing mail orders daily. And then if you want to come in and browse, we're doing appointments on Fridays and Saturdays. So you can just visit murderbooks.com. The top image on our homepage will send you to um, making an appointment if you're local and you'd like to come in. Um, sorry, it's a lot to say, but I'm going <laughs> to conclude with this too. Um, if, if you are enjoying our events, and you are able, we would love nothing more than for you to support the author and support us by ordering the books. We also um, put a virtual tip jar in the comments, just in case you want to send something our way to let us know that you are enjoying them. Maybe buying a book right now isn't um, in, the, in the stars, or maybe you already have it, but um, we appreciate anything that you can send our way and do appreciate you watching. Um, I'll be back on here tomorrow night with Lee Child, uh, Cara Black, and Hannah Tenty to discuss the Nicotine Chronicles, their new short story collection. And so hopefully we'll see you back then. Thanks so much, Mark, and you have a wonderful vacation. Thank you, McKenna. I really appreciate you having me, and thanks to everybody who's watched tonight. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, and uh, go out and buy the Hugo Marston books, people. Bye. <laughs> Bye.